Hey guys, welcome back to my crypto journal, the channel that brings you guys altcoin analysis as well as NFT opportunities in the market. Today, we're going to be taking a look at up and coming game that is managing to make a name for itself. And that game is called DeFi Kingdoms. You guys can take a look at the map over here and it's building up to be a pretty good game so far. I'm going to go over some of the mechanics of how to make money in this game and more importantly, how to optimize making money in this game because I've made a lot of mistakes that have cost me a lot of money. So I'm going to go ahead and cut all those mistakes down for you guys so you guys can make the best decisions possible when it, when trying to make a return on this game. Now, the reason I'm talking about DeFi Kingdoms is because we have a strong narrative within crypto building right now, and that involves DeFi, NFT, and Metaverse. And what Jewel, or I should say DeFi Kingdom does, is it combines all the three to make an interesting and fun game that provides pretty nice returns, at least so far. We'll have to see how this adapts as time goes on and whether this game actually has some staying power. So the first thing I want to talk about when it comes to DeFi Kingdoms is the incentives in the game and, and how it allows the economy to thrive by keeping the money rolling within the economy. And to do that, we're going to have to take a look at the gardens first. Now, I'm going to break this video into a couple of different sections. Uh, the, the gardens are a pretty simple section. The next section we're going to go over is summoning uh, and professions, which is a pretty lengthy section and where most of my mistakes were made because there's a lot that goes into it. So make sure to watch that part extra carefully because there's going to be a lot of information stacked on top of each other. And I'll try to simplify it for you guys, but sometimes it is what it is. There's a ton of information there. And the next thing I'm going to talk about is what we're waiting for in terms of game development because they're building as we're going right now. So not everything that's going to be in the game is in the game right now. And that involves things like PvP, uh, as well as expansions within the game, which will have a pretty drastic impact on price, I believe. And finally, speaking of price, we're going to go over the jewel chart over here because I think we're going to have some interesting price action within the coming days and possibly even weeks. So stick around for that part. All right, so let's kick it off with the gardens on DeFi kingdoms over here. Now, the gardens over here are pretty similar to other farms you would have in DeFi, except it's put in a video game. Now, if you guys are familiar with Solar Beam, this is a farm offering different rewards depending on the liquidity you provide with different pairs. And usually when you do this, you provide 50% solar or 50% mover to receive the 160 annualized APR as a reward. It's no different than Spirit Swap over here on Phantom. You provide uh, USDC and Phantom LP to, re to receive these 90% APRs. Now, DeFi Kingdoms is no different except for some slight differences. <laughs> so it's pretty it's pretty much simple here. The APRs are a lot higher, and I think it's because we don't have as many people in these, so they're not completely diluted. Of course, you've got different pairs uh, with the lowest APR providing pair, which is all the way down here, is gonna be around 36% for Bitcoin and Ethereum, which is still really good, given that these are the two biggest uh, coins in the market. And as I scroll up, you guys can see the different pairs available to the market with their APRs. Now, these have been going down. It started off at around 800% just a month ago, and they've been cut in half. So I imagine as time goes on and this game gets more popular, these APRs are going to get knocked down. When the game first launched, I think they were in the thousands, starting out with 20,000%, and people made a ton of money off of this. Now, there are some catches, all right? So we're going to talk about the catch over here. When you deposit money or jewel or let's say Jewel and Matic over here, you're gonna to have to do a 50-50 split to receive this 452. But the way they're keeping the users protected and incentivizing a longer lockup period is by saying that if you provide LP here, there is gonna be a withdrawal fee. And depending on how long you wait, the withdrawal fee gets reduced every couple of hours. If you decide to withdraw within the hour, you're gonna get hit with a hefty 8% withdrawal fee. And as time goes on, it gets less, 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 and less, as you guys can see over here. You guys can read this. The reason they do this is because they want to protect against flash loans and pump and dumps. That's why they've got the withdrawal mechanism implemented here. Now, that's just one catch. There's one more catch that comes with the gardens. And that has to do with a lockup. So I'm going to give you guys a quick example. Uh, I think we're currently on Epoch 20. Don't quote me on that. I don't exactly know what Epoch we're at. I do know how much we're allowed to claim approximately when it comes to these rewards. So when you provide liquidity and you start earning rewards instantly on these gardens, a portion of these rewards are going to be locked, a pretty big portion. And this is how I think they protect the economy a little bit because you can't just collect these rewards and go ahead and dump them in the market. Instead, you 
can unlock around, I think it's 40 or 37% of the rewards right away. So if I was to provide liquidity for these pools and I received 10 Joule over how, however many days, I would only be able to take out around 3.7 Joule instantly. The rest would be locked up until I think it's July 15th, around mid-July, where they would be unlocked linearly along the year. So I think that's a good way to have the rewards uh, locked up because that way you're not just dumping your rewards in the market right away and just destroying the price. I think this is a good way to keep the, the economy alive and the game alive because it's not just sucking resources out of the game. Instead, it's promoting the economy within the game so you can keep playing and keep throwing money in the game, which for the long term provides a pretty sustainable ecosystem. So we'll have to wait and see what happens on July once the rewards are locked for many of the whales. I think we might see a little bit of a dump as a lot of people are waiting to cash out Jewel that has been locked for almost a year which I think people would want to cash out, understandably so, especially if the price of this token moons. So that is the gardening aspect within the game, and it's pretty simple. So the last thing I'm going to show you guys is how to get the LP positions that you want. So over here in the marketplace, I went to the menu to click on the marketplace to get here. The trader is the DEX, basically the Uniswap of this game, and what you do is you, you can swap out your currency for whatever currency is available over here. And if you wanted to buy into the gardens, you'd have to pick the LP pair. So let's say you want a jewel and the other pair I wanted was, let's say one, I would swap my jewel for one. And once I get that, I would go to the druid and tell him I would like to buy some seeds. And I don't have any co tokens on me to split right now, but you'd click this button. That would be green for you guys if you had the right pair and create the LP tokens. Now, once you do that, that's not the end of it. You've got to go back to the gardens over here and actually deposit your LP tokens into the pool. And once you do that, you'll start earning rewards instantly. So that's pretty much it for the gardens. And it's a pretty good reward if you ask me for, for basically doing nothing. Yes, the lockup period is a little annoying, but if you believe this game is gonna survive until end of the year at least, then it's pretty, uh, pretty good odds. So that's it for the gardens. Now let's go back to the world map. So the next place we're gonna talk about is the bank because it's kind of similar to the gardens. And I think the bank provides you around 30% APR. So you guys can see stake your jewel tokens and earn one third of the generated trading fees as a reward. So once you deposit your jewel over here, you'll receive an X jewel balance, which is worth 1.658 jewel. So as people are using this protocol, you'll be earning the trading fees that are generated by the users. And you guys will see the number go up if you have any jewel deposited in here. And that's pretty much all I've got to say about the bank. It's a pretty simple thing. I'll talk about the rewards that come with the bank uh, in terms of a snapshot at the end of the video because there is a section about that you guys should know. So next up, we've got the tavern. And this is going to be a lengthy section, so get ready, guys. So I've made most of my mistakes when it's come to purchasing, leveling, summoning heroes, okay? There is different aspects to this game. There is the professions aspect. There is the questing aspect, which ties into the professions. There is the summoning aspect of this game. And finally, the one that's not released is the PvP aspect, which you should also prepare for. So let's talk about the summoning aspect first, which will tie on tie into professions and questing all together. Uh, and I'm going to try to keep it simple because it does get pretty uh, heavy. So here are the different kinds of classes we've got available to us. Each one has a role in the game, and we'll talk about that. Uh, you guys can see the subclasses. As you can see here, the wizard is the main class, the priest is the subclass, and then we've got the level of the priest over here or the wizard and the generations okay so first off let's talk about the generations because uh, it's pretty important and something you should you guys should know before even thinking about purchasing a hero so it goes from generation zero all the way to 11 uh, the main thing you should know about the gens when summoning heroes is that the cost of summoning increases as the generation goes up and not only that, but the max summons of each generation goes down as the generation increases. So I'm going to go ahead and show you the summons first, and then I'll show you the costs. So you guys can see over here on Gen 11, um, there's there's no heroes on Gen 11. We're going to have to go to Gen 3. So on Gen 3, there are a couple of things you guys should notice. If we arrange this by summons, the lowest, the highest summons that a Gen 3 can have, I think is about not eight summons. So over here, you guys can see the lowest one is about eight. That's because when you go down one, it just decreases by one. So four should have seven, five should have six, six should have five, and so on and so forth. And that's the one important part of the gens you should know. The next important part is the 
summoning costs that are associated with them. So here you can see summoning cost, uh, summoning jewel cost per hero. Now, if you have a hero with 10 summons available and he's a Gen 1, it's going to cost you 16 jewel per hero. So if you combine two Gen 1s, it's going to cost you 32 jewel to summon because each cost is 16 on its own, not together. And when you get to nine summons on the hero, it gets to 18. When you get to eight summons, it's going to cost you 20. And the same eight summons that you have on Gen 1 would cost you 30 on a Gen 2. It just gets higher and higher. So it's I think it's more cost effective. Of course, it depends. It's more cost effective to go with the earlier gens uh, if the market is offering better rates. It depends. This can change. So you're going to have to do some research to find what the prices are at the time of you trying to summon. So that's the important thing you guys should know with the with the gen function of the game. Now, the next important function of the game you guys should know is the leveling. The one thing you guys can't do when it comes to buying heroes is you can't speed up leveling in any type of way. It's going to have to level the, in the exact same time it took this guy to reach from one to three. So for me, I think buying a higher level hero is better than buying a lower level hero simply because a higher level hero will have better rewards most likely because they have more experience under their belt when it comes to their professions. So you guys can see this forward has a 9.5, which is pretty high. He's a level three. And we can take a look at the stats here. And I'll link all these uh, resources that I have on the tabs up here. You guys can see I've got many resources. Uh, and I'll link them down below. These resources were made by community members, which, by the way, is so important because this game wouldn't be what it was if it wasn't for the community. Uh, they just have so many resources to help you make better decisions in game uh, and that means better financial decisions so as i was talking the the level one heroes in the game i think there's about 25 percent level one heroes the next up we have 29,000 level two heroes and then you guys can see there's uh 34 level three heroes and we're starting to get some level fours pop up here you guys can see the summons uh and the sales to date uh, they've gone down a little bit the summons and the price has gone up i do imagine the summons is going to go down as the price increases because it's going to get more expensive to summon but we'll have to see how that plays out so yeah like i said i'd go for the higher level heroes so i would be filtering for gen one and let's say level two or three that's what i'm going to be filtering for right now okay let's say i wanted to create a summoner now some of you guys might be wondering why would i want to create a summoner Okay, back to this little cheat sheet. So when creating a hero, you want to keep a couple things in mind. You're going to want to create them for a specific task. Uh, you could also create them for a task, but choose to resell them later. But at least you have a very good uh, hero with good stats that other people would want to buy. Because really, you want to create a hero that other people would want to buy. So here we have the different professions in the game and the classes that excel at them. So for me right now, I'm looking to make a forager which means I would want to create a summoner. To create a summoner, we have this little cheat sheet down here, which has the basic classes, the advanced classes, the elite classes, and the exalted class, which is just the Dread Knight. Really hard to get. And remember how I talked about the different generations having lower summons as you get higher and higher? Well, it's kind of similar with these uh, higher classes. So the advanced class can only have a max of five summons, whereas the basic has 10, right? And then the elite class can have the max of three summons and then exalted class i think has just one and you can't even summon with them because there's nothing else so when going to buy one of these classes and i'm trying to optimize the stats there's a couple things i want i want a high level priest or wizard because if i'm going to buy these guys i also intend to use them i want to get 10 summons if i can for the most bang for my buck and i want to get them as a, as a forager because uh, if i want to create a summoner the odds of passing my genes on to the summoner if I'm a forager is higher to create a foraging summoner. Not only that, but I prefer to have main stats of dexterity and intellect. So let's put that into action and see how it looks like. Over here, we've got the level one, gen three. We don't want gen three. We're gonna apply this filter to get the gen ones only. I've got, it. sometimes it bugs out. You can see it's still giving me gen three, the, this bugs out. So what I have to do is close this, go back to buy, and now it'll filter for me. These are little hacks you find out while playing the game. So we have to scroll all the way down to find the level, the, the 10 summons. There you go. And you guys can see we've got a, well, this is a pretty expensive card, 529 level two. Let's see what the 
stats are. So you can see we've got intellect as a main bonus, which is really good. So this is really good for us. Agility, not exactly desirable, but it'll have to do. And then we're looking for this to combine up to 25. So he's a level two. Usually on level ones, I'd look for a 20 combined stat for the profession I'm going for. So as we mentioned, we're looking for int and dexterity. We're at 25, which, which is really, really good. So this is a really nice card, but it's also out of my price range. I'm not really looking to spend 529 as a beginner, as I'm, big, I'm, I'm trying to figure out this game. But this is an example of a good card. Now, there is one more thing that is more advanced that I'd look into when trying to create a summoner. And that is, these guys actually have recessive genes. There are dominant genes and recessive genes. So if I wanted to find out the details of that character's genes, I would have to use one of the resources that is provided by the community. And that would be this website right here. It's called DFK Watch. And I hate that there is no dark mode turned on. I don't know why, but it's not. So we're just going to go ahead and have to be blinded by the white screen in our face right here. And as I go ahead and type in the hero ID, you guys, I took the hero ID right up there, 84299, plugged it in here to get the main stats over here and then the recessive genes over here. So I can see that the recessive gene, the R1 gene over here is a pirate, pirate, foraging which is good so it's good that we have foraging it means they we're going to get a 91 percent chance to get a forager within the game we also have a high chance of getting wisdom as a blue boost and as a as a green boost endurance which might be good for pvp or dexterity which is good for our uh, profession so all in all this is good it's not great and i'll tell you guys why in a second the main class is a pirate if i wanted to have the best chance of summoning a, a priest or a summoner i would need it to be a priest priest and I'll show you guys why I'm gonna go ahead and try to find a priest priest and a wizard wizard for you guys so I can demonstrate why it would be beneficial for you guys to have the recessive gene being the same as the main gene okay it's gonna take me a little bit to find out so I'm gonna cut when I do find them all right here we are again and I managed to find a priest priest and a wizard wizard now I'm not gonna go ahead and show you where the wizard was or the the priest was on DeFi kingdoms because it doesn't really matter what really matters is that when you find them and you filter them out on this website and you get a priest uh, you plug them into this other website which is called DK Profesh, DFK Professions and you plug them into each ID search box once you do that you'll hit the submit button and you will get the percentage chance of getting a specific class all right so over here you guys can see I've got a 17% chance to summon a summoner now, if I was going to go ahead and take a different one, like let's say I took this priest over here and I plugged it into where the priest ID is, which is the 7616, and then I redid it, you guys would see this percentage of getting a summoner would fall to maybe 13%, 14%. So that's the reason why it's important to find a main class with the same recessive gene because it increases the likelihood that you'd get a summoner which will, which will save you money and then will increase your profits if you decide to resell them, okay? So that's a really important part of the game that most people who are getting into it don't really know. And finally, the last thing you guys should know about summoning is that when you have 10 out of 10 summons, uh, your, the hero you summon is going to be a Gen 2, assuming they're both Gen 1s, but they'll have 9 summons. So the, the summon count always goes down by 1. If I, have, if I summon with two Gen 1s, but one has a 7 and the other one has a 6, I'll summon a 5 for the third result. Okay, so it always goes down one. Um, if I have a 10 out of 10 with another 10 out of 10, it'll be 9 summons Gen 2 as the card that comes out as a result. So I hope that makes sense, and that is pretty much what you have to know when it comes about the summoning process and making decisions on buying certain heroes against others. What I would say is, for me personally, I go for the uh, summoner usually because I, I like to forage right now and I like to fish. And I'll tell you why in just a second as I pull this sheet up. Right now, gardening and mining haven't come out in the main game, so there's a lot of demand for them and there's a lot of increase in price. So foraging and fishing have been neglected a little bit, so I try to go for those two other than the two professions over here. Once the price and the hype begins to fall for the miner and gardener, I'll end up buying them. But right now, because it's being hyped up and, and anticipated, I'm not really a fan of it. Now, before I move on to the next section, I forgot to mention, if you want to summon, you're going to have to go to the portal area. And then over here, you'll see the summoner and the arc druid. 
what you do is you go to the Arc Druid, you go to Infuse Crystal, and to actually summon, you're going to need 20 Gaia's Tears. And the way you get Gaia's Tears is by either A, doing quests, or you can just go to the Tavern, or another Tavern, the Marketplace, go to the Druid, I mean the Trader, and then swap your tokens for some Tears. And there you go, you just type in 20, take the Tears, you go back to the portal, bada bing bada boom, you go to this guy, tell him, hey, I want to make a baby, and then you put in your hero, your other hero, and then you begin summon, and it'll break down the cost for you. So this is a very fun aspect of the game because it involves a little bit of gambling, but that's how you summon the hero from A to Z. So I'm going to go ahead and talk about the next thing in here, which is the professions and why you'd want to get a miner over a gardener, over a forager or a fisher. So let's take a look at the professions area of this game because it does yield you some money. So over here in the professions area, you've got the fisher, forager and the other two. Right now, gardening is coming soon. Mining is coming soon. So Within this game, there's going to be a PvP, and you guys can see we've got the Alchemist here, which I think is going to utilize the ingredients we receive from the Fisher and the ingredients we receive from the Forager. So even they will have a higher demand in the future once this comes out. I don't think a lot of people realize that, which is why they're flying under the radar and why I was accumulating before. So what the Miner provides you with is that, remember how we talked about your rewards in the Garden are going to be locked? Well, the Miners actually unlock those rewards for you as you do the quests, which is really important because if you want to get access to those jewels before July 15th, then you can do something about it by buying miners or breeding miners and putting them to work in the mines so they can unlock that locked jewel. Really big deal. The next thing over here is the gardener. The gardener actually provides you with bonus APR depending on the amount of money you have within the liquidity pools. So the higher percentage you have within the liquidity pools, the more rewards you will get for your quests as a gardener. Something really important to note. The fisher will get you rewards of uh, different varying levels of rare fish that I think will be used with the alchemist and the forager, the same thing. You'll get rare plants that will be used with the alchemist. Now, the reason why you want a hero who is a forager actually foraging is because they'll be able to go on more quests for you and actually be more efficient at doing the job. Uh, a hero that isn't a forager will have to use seven stamina, which allows them to go on three quests at level one. But if you have a forager who goes on a foraging quest, they'll be able to go on five quests because they'll only be utilizing five stamina during the day. I think you can do these quests around three times a day. So in total, it'll be 15 quests and they provide you with pretty good rewards the higher your skill is and the higher your level is. So you're going to be wanting to do these every time they're available. Make sure to utilize your heroes. Don't let them just sit down because they are money printers as long as you use them. There are 100 levels in this game and who knows how long this bull run will last. It'll be generating you rewards that you can sell in the market and a way for you to utilize your heroes. So that's what we've got for professions right now. Now, there are other aspects of this game that haven't even come out, which is the pvp side of the game and if you guys look over here on the roadmap you guys can see we've only hit phase two actually no it's it's phase phase yeah phase two and heroes and quests that's pretty much what's out not even the full quests are out we still we're still waiting for uh mining and gardening once that comes out i think they'll be going on to phase three which is kingdoms and land there'll be land auctions world map expansions and then some lucky people will get kingdom plots which will be given to those who are staking within the bank. So there's another reason to stake in the bank and receive that APR. Those are the incentives to keep your money locked in the game that, again, allows the game to grow and the price action to be more positive than other games would be. There's just more incentive to keep your money in the game. After that, we've got buildings coming in on the plots of land that you own. Uh, resource buildings can be built next to resource nodes, so you can assume that these uh, kingdoms will be providing you more passive income on top of what's already going in with the gardens and the quests. So this game is looking to just be a game you can play to generate money and uh, have a little fun with. Will this game actually be fun? So far, so good. It's all right. You know, there's not much active gameplay within it, which I'm hoping the PvP system will actually fix. Phase five is equipment. Uh, you guys can see 100 mythic amulets for raffle winners who held an average of 5,000 X jewels from December 15th to the to January 15th. So again, more rewards for those taken within the bank, more incentives. Uh, I think there's going to be more rewards than just amulets within uh, as we go down the progress of the game, but this is just an example. And finally, we've got the battle system, uh, which will be coming to the game once we get to the phase six. 
Heroes will be able to perform parties of three and compete in regular PvP tournaments. So if you guys ever played World of Warcraft, maybe Arena 3v3 style games, uh, which will earn jewel prizes. So there's still a lot to come for this game, it seems. And so long as this market can stay in a bull market, then we've got positive price action coming for this game. So that leads me to the expansion of this game that I want to talk to you guys about. And that is the expansion to the Avalanche chain. It was announced on, I believe it was January 3rd, that there is going to be airdrops happening within the game for people who have their money locked in the bank, who are utilizing the uh, gardens, who are summoning who have heroes. So they're trying to reward those who are active within the game. They're incentivizing, once again, those who hold their jewel within the game and are actually playing the game, they're gonna get rewards for doing so. So here's the post you guys can see. Hey everyone, it's so inspiring to see us hit 50K milestones for community members. And there's gonna be a different amount of airdrops happening for different people who utilize the game in different ways. The bank has been historically, they've been the best way to qualify for airdrops and that isn't changing. They're allocating 600k crystals to be awarded to extra jewel holders according to their average holdings between January 3rd and January 24th. So price is probably going to be rising between those days as people uh, continue to buy the dips or latecomers buy the current price and putting them in the bank to receive those airdrops. In addition, they'll be giving away 25 shiny Crystal Veil vale Gen Zero heroes in the raffle. This is huge because each Gen, uh, Gen Zero character right now in the game costs around, uh, I think, 50 to 100k. So there is only 25 of them, and most likely the whales are going to get them, but you never know. There's always random odds in the, in the world that are going to be playing in your favor, and I might get one, you might get one, depending if we're lucky or not. So players will receive one entry for 100x jewels and additional two entries for every other 100x jewel. Okay, that's just one way. The second way is people who own heroes are going to receive airdrops of crystals depending on the rarity of those heroes. So you guys can see the rarities here. And then finally, we've got, actually not finally, there's three more categories. <laughs> and then we've got people who summon heroes will also receive one raffle entry for a Gen Zero Crystal Vare hero. So again, there's 10 drawings, meaning 10 opportunities for Gen Zeros for those who summon between Gen 1st and... I think it's Jan 22nd or Jan 21st. Cool. And then two more LP holders. That means the gardens. And we've got the bridge jeweled uh, holders on Avalanche. So holders of bridged Avalanche jewels will receive a collective 100K crystal airdrop. The people who are in the gardens will also receive uh, crystal airdrops depending on the liquidity amount they're providing within the gardens. So again, more incentives to get you to buy these things and receive these airdrops. So I think the price action for when we hit uh, January 22nd, maybe, is going to be very interesting on the charts as people begin to dump their jewel, possibly, so because the snapshot's over. So we'll have to take a look at the charts, which brings me to the next and final section of this video, the TA section. So this is a quick shameless plug for my private group. You guys can see I talked about DeFi Kingdoms over here in uh, December 19th when I announced it to my group first. This is the post we first started being interested in this game when it was around $11 per jewel. And that was about my average buying for this game, around $11 as we were coming up over here. And then we had this little dip at 12, and then we made the run when the announcement came that there was gonna be airdrops for uh, those who were playing the game, staking and have the money in the game. So that's what I think this run up was for. People were stacking up on jewel to receive those Gen Z's, possible Gen Zeros and those airdrops. And it's continuing to go here now after Bitcoin dipped and is beginning to recover. So what do I think is going to happen with price as time goes on in the short term, especially between now and January 2nd? Well, I definitely think it's got an easy time to break the stop. It's not going to be too hard. We might get a little bit of a dip first down to the $17, $18 level before we take off one more time. There's really no telling. But this is looking pretty good from a price action standpoint. You know, we had the well, this is as far as it goes. I know this game launched way earlier than $5. I think it was around a dollar. And we had some really good price action here. Long consolidation between the beginning of December or late November to beginning of December. And we began the run. And I think this is just the beginning when it comes to this game because there's a lot of, there's a very strong community and they're building out the game in a way that makes sense. And the chart looks really good. Now, if we were to begin to break down below 15, that's when I would say the chart looks really bad and I'm not so interested in this anymore. But right now, because we've got so many things going for this game in terms of development and snapshots, I would, wouldn't be surprised to see us break up to $30 before the snapshot. So what we're looking for here is a break of the top and head towards the $28 range, possibly $30, before we pull back 
to $22 and continue our move up to 35. Now, if we look at the total market cap for this game over here, if we type in Jewel and head to DeFi Kingdoms and see what it's at, it's at 1.3. Compare that to Axie Infinity, which is about 5.8 billion. This game still has a lot of room to grow. So I've got a couple of targets for DeFi Kingdoms on my chart. Where I think it's going to go is, as mentioned, $28 is going to be an important target over here. And then we've got $38, which is going to prove to be another important point. So I'm going to be taking my profits at different points in this chart. One, as I mentioned, is going to be $28. The second one is going to be about $38. And finally, I think the final place I would say that we're going to head to is around $58, which I think would put the market cap around $3.3 billion, if I'm not mistaken. Let me just do the math real quick off screen. Yeah, around, let's say, $4 billion. $4 billion to get up there. So that doesn't exactly flip Axie Infinity, but it gets pretty damn close, and I'm not looking to be a, all greedy about this. I'll be happy with my, with my 6X because I bought in at around $11 average. That's pretty much my plan when it comes to uh, Jewel DeFi Kingdoms. I think we're going to get some nice price increase going on on Jewel, especially with all the incentives to keep your money locked in the game. It's going to be huge because Axie Infinity is the closest comparison we have to another DeFi Kingdom game that is actually successful. Uh, the price action, I think, should go something a little bit like this in the near future. Maybe not as aggressive because this was really parabolic in all sense of the word. Like, this is insane. Uh, do I think DeFi Kingdom is going to do that? Well, it all also depends on Bitcoin. If Bitcoin doesn't manage to hold above 40K, then this isn't going to be possible for DeFi Kingdoms. We really need to see us hold this level and actually continue to go up. If we manage to make it up to 56K on Bitcoin, then I imagine Jewel is going to be able to, you know, skyrocket and make that $58 level over there. So right now, my plan is to take profit at these important levels and possibly if we don't get to $28, I'll be taking profit on a, on a time gated sense. So on the 20th of January is when I I'm going to decide to take some profit because I think there's going to be a dump once people are over with the snapshot and they've gotten what they needed out of it and they'll cash out a little bit. So that's what I think is going to happen. At least that's going to be my plan. I'm trying to lock in some profits because the markets in general, uh, I, want to, I want to secure some profits and reduce some risk. So that's pretty much my plan when it comes to DeFi Kingdoms. I hope you guys enjoyed the video. And if you did, make sure to subscribe, follow me on Twitter and hit the like button because a lot of work went into this video. So with that said, I will see you guys on the next video on Monday. Happy trading and stay safe out there. Peace.